Uh, a lot of people ask, to what extent is modern Hebrew similar to ancient Hebrew? So I think I can personally attest, uh, I, I could be used as a litmus test, at least until relatively recently, when I didn't know any modern Hebrew at all. Uh, and uh, when I was about 22 or 23 years old, I was dating a certain lady who was from Israel who didn't know any English yet. And uh, when we were talking, she mentioned a word that I didn't know. She understood me perfectly, even though my Hebrew was basically based on the Talmud, the Mishnah, the uh, Biblical Hebrew. There's two different Hebrews we have, at least, before modern Hebrew. The Biblical Hebrew and the Rabbinical Hebrew. Now, the Talmud is mainly uh, written in Aramaic, which is a language near, uh, close enough to Hebrew, but not exactly. The difference between Aramaic and Hebrew is bigger than the difference between British English and American English, but it's a smaller difference than between, let's say, Ukrainian and Russian languages. So it's a language that's uh, from the same group as Hebrew, and it, uh, uh, there are a lot of Aramaic words in, that enter the rabbinical Hebrew, but it's a different language. So, so if you learn the Babylonian Talmud, it's one uh, version of Aramaic. If you learn the Jerusalem Talmud, what's called, they used to call it Palestinian Talmud, uh, before the Arabs uh, started using that name for, 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 for them. Uh, it used to be that the Jews called, were called Palestinians, so they used to call it in English Palestinian Talmud, the Talmud of, of Eretz Israel the land of Israel. Anyway, so, so, so the Talmud of Eretz Israel uses a slightly different version of Aramaic. It's what's called Syriac, or Middle Aramaic. Uh, plus, uh, there is pure Hebrew. But again, rabbinical Hebrew is somewhat different than, uh, than the biblical Hebrew. So those are the, the books that I was studying, the, 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 the Torah, the Bible, the, uh, the rabbinical works, and that's the Hebrew I knew. And I was able to speak to her and she understood me. But I didn't always understand her. I would say that maybe 5% of the words that she said or less, I didn't, didn't understand. Sometimes I could make what they mean out of context, but sometimes I couldn't even do that. So in particular, she mentioned we're talking about furniture, at least she wanted to say the word furniture, and I had no idea how the modern Hebrew, what, what word is used. Because in the times of Hazar, apparently in the biblical times or in the times of the Talmud, we don't have a word for furniture specifically. There's a word kelim, which means vessels, which could mean anything. It could mean uh, cups, or it could mean a chair or, or a table as well. So furniture was included in the general word kelim. Tools, I guess, would be the, the, the translation. Tools, right? Tools for eating or tools for sitting. It doesn't matter. Everything was included. Uh, so I don't know if any other word was used. You see, there are some words that we simply don't know what they were using, which word they were using in ancient times. I'll give you a simple example. Obviously, there was some word for coughing, right? People coughed, right? We know how they you called sneezing. It's a biblical word. There's a word for sneezing in Hebrew, it's even in the Torah, in the Tanakh. Uh, but in terms of coughing, there's no word such, such word in Tanakh anywhere. And apparently in the words of the, the Talmudic uh, literature and Midrashim also, there's no clear word for coughing. One place where maybe that, 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 that seems to be might be coughing, or it's a type of cough, is uh, uh, goneach. Maybe that meant coughing of some sort. Maybe it's coughing with like blood and things like that. It's not exactly clear, uh, but... The general coughing, there was no clear word. So, shi'ul, which is the, the word used today, it's actually not purely from modern Hebrew. It appeared in Jewish literature earlier, in certain medical books, and was taken from Arabic, from what I understand. At that time, Arabs, by the way, were very advanced. In the Middle Ages, it's known that the Arab culture and our Arab countries were far more uh, advanced than the, the, the Christian countries. At that time, the, the Dark Ages, right, uh, France, um, Germany, those were not the places where there was a lot of uh, science, let's say. But the Arabs were at that time, um, there were a lot of uh, doctors, uh, philosophers, uh, poets, there was a lot of science. So, and uh, literature, science and literature. So anyway, a lot of, by the way, Greek, ancient Greek books, it's very interesting, that story. The ancient Greece, which had a tremendous amount of science for the time, uh, the, the knowledge was lost, basically, but it was preserved by the Arabs, and later it was retranslated, and Europeans got it, basically, through the Arabs, got back their original heritage. But whatever the case may be, so Shi'ul came, from what I understand, from the uh, Arabic works on, on, on medicine. The, the Jews in, in those times started using that word, and then, of course, it made it into modern Hebrew. So my point is that, obviously, there was some word that, that the people in the biblical times used. We just don't know what it is because nowhere in the Bible there is coughing, even though there is sneezing. Um, by the way, uh, sneezing might be onomatopoeia, what they call it, uh, when the, a word sounds like what it is. Uh, but whatever the case may be, um, the word for 
furniture, at least I'm not aware of any such word in uh, the times of Hazal or earlier times, but uh, the word she used for furniture is the modern Hebrew word, uh, Rehitim. So I was wondering what it is. I asked her back in Hebrew, what is she saying? And she tried to explain to me what this word means, and I understood that it means furniture. So it's interesting that this word apparently appears in our parsha with slightly different vowels, but the consonants are the same. And there it means when Yaakov was uh, giving water to the uh, animals, um, it was these um, uh, um, containers of water that are on the, on the, on the ground, I guess, Some, something where the water is stored, at least according to some Mifarshim. Or maybe it was channels of water. So this is the uh, Rehatim that's mentioned in our parsha. There's another uh, mention of this word later in the, in the story of Moshe when he is uh, giving water to the uh, animals of uh, uh, the Tsipora and other daughters of Yitro were feeding, were, were, where he met them uh, the first time and later married Tsipora. So that's where the, 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 the five books of Moshe mention this word. And later it appears in Shirashirim in two places. And it's not exactly clear if, if, if this word, uh, as it appears in Shirashirim, in the Song of Songs, if it has to do with the word here or it's a different word. But at least some commentators, for instance, Mitsudat Sion, think it's the same word. But there, apparently, it means some kind of a um, part of the structure of the house, maybe the, the, the wood that's holding the house together or something like that. The bulk wood. Uh, whatever the case may be, it w didn't mean furniture in those times, but it meant something close enough. Right? Some kind of kilimos, uh, either for uh, letting the, the animals drink from, or later uh, parts of what holds the house together. So later, I, I guess, the rest of the furniture uh, be began to be called rehitim. So this is just an interesting example where the word is new, but it's based on a biblical word that's close in its meaning. And there are a lot of such words. Kaftor, for instance, is a button. In, in modern Hebrew. And there is kaftor in the Torah, which is part of the menorah. Uh, it's uh, um, some shape, I guess, that's similar to a button or, or, or somewhat similar. So these are just examples where modern Hebrew used ancient words with slightly new meaning. This, that, by, by the way, is not unique for Hebrew. This is a, a very common thing in English also that, uh, uh, for instance, even the word button, right? Button is, of course, originally what we use to hold the clothing together, or maybe decorative buttons. But later, the button that we push, right, was, was the same word was used once uh, devices were invented to, uh, that have buttons that turn them on or, or, or do other things to the device, maybe turn the light on within that device, something like that. So these were also called buttons. They look like a button, even though it's not the same type of button. In fact, in some languages, it's a different word. But in English, it's the same word, button. So, so this is common that a, a word that has some meaning gets an additional meaning when some science develops or maybe it's a, you know, some medical meaning or whatever the case may be. Uh, what I wanted to say out of all of this is that we have to realize that in general, Hebrew was always a language of the Jewish people. We lived in different places and our main language of speech was not necessarily Hebrew. In Europe, the most common language was Yiddish, which is a, a German, uh, ancient German with some Hebrew words and specific accent and certain other specific rules. But for the most part, it's based on German, of course. Everybody knows that. It was written in Hebrew letters, uh, but uh, it was a German language with some Hebrew words. Like soul or Torah and other similar words, of course, were, were taken from Hebrew. But the, the regular words like a chair or... or a, or, uh, or, or um, all the regular words that people use in that language, that was mainly taken from German. So that's the Yiddish. And there were similar languages in other places where Jews lived. But that doesn't mean that we didn't know Hebrew. Everybody knew Hebrew. At least all the people who learned Torah, which is a big commandment by the Jewish people, and of course all the prayers are in Hebrew. Until relatively recently, all Jews prayed always in Hebrew. So some knowledge of Hebrew everybody had. Even the, so, the, the person who would be complete um, ignoramus, a person who is not a very knowledgeable person, but some Hebrew they would know. And, of course, the scholars of Torah, almost all their books were written always in Hebrew. You could take any time period, whether it's Jews in Europe or Jews living in other places of the world, certainly the Sephardi Jews, 
the, the books are almost always written in Hebrew. There were sometimes that certain books were written in other languages with Hebrew letters, as I said, Yiddish, or in, in Arab countries it was a, a Jewish Arabic, uh, some books were written in. But Hebrew was the main language, and everybody, all, all the scholars certainly knew Hebrew, and all the prayers were in Hebrew. So at least in theory, people could communicate in Hebrew. Once you know the language on that level, you could communicate. So if, for instance, a, a person from uh, some Arab country would come to Europe, would travel to Europe, how would he talk to other Jews? Only in Hebrew, right? He didn't know Yiddish. The only language that they would have in common is Hebrew. And like I said, when I knew practically no modern Hebrew, I was able to communicate to a person who didn't know any English. And she understood me. I understood most of what she was saying. So Hebrew was always a language bias. It, wasn't, it didn't include a lot of the new words. Certainly all the fruits, for instance, in different uh, uh, places where Jews lived, they would use different words for the same fruit, depending on the... Uh, common language where they lived. For instance, how do you call a, an orange? In modern Hebrew, it's called a golden apple, literally. Both words are Hebrew, uh, are biblical Hebrew, or the word golden, the word apple. But uh, they simply used a, 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 a uh, tapuz is short for tapur zahav, golden apple. So some linguists suggested it, let's say, 100 years ago or whatever, and that's how they started using it. So what do you think they did, let's say, two, 300 years ago where the Jews lived? A lot of times they would simply use either the common word that was in their country. Uh, Pomerans, I think, was one of the words that was used for, for oranges or, or other ways to, 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 to call it. There was no one standard way to call it. A lot of times, by the way, the words uh, came to all the languages and were sort of similar. For instance, coffee. Coffee in almost other languages is called the same way. So in Hebrew also, in different places, the writings of rabbis, the, the word coffee is spelled differently. There are like maybe five or six different ways to spell the word coffee. And in modern Hebrew, they just chose one of those ways. But before the, inv the invention of modern Hebrew, the, the Jews also knew when, when they saw the various spells on coffee that that's what it means. Or, or, or tea, the same way in Hebrew, tea. There was a question of to, to write with tet or with tav. Uh, so modern Hebrew usually chooses one specific spelling, but in the books before that, you could find different spellings. But it was still called T everywhere. Uh, so this is just examples where uh, we have the modern Hebrew. This is just a slightly additional language on top of already existing language. But it's not like we completely recovered a new dead language. Hebrew was never dead to us, and it was used for some communication and certainly for all the writings and prayers and re reading the Torah. So, so I'm saying that uh, Hebrew was never lost to the Jewish people. Uh, it's, uh, the, 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 the idea of modern Hebrew was only a, a, an addition and the, the standardization, if you could call it, of a lot of the words that until then were either spelled differently or even were used differently. All the fruits, all the... Uh, right? In many cases, uh, the, 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 the choice was very simple, like avocado is in all the, most, of, most of the languages is the same word. So it's the same in, in Hebrew. But with the oranges, they decided to use their own special word. And similarly with tomatoes, again, in some books, a uh, hundred or more years ago, you could find tomato just called the same way in Hebrew letters, tomato. But uh, today, uh, there is a special word that uh, certain linguists introduced. There were a number of Jewish linguists at the time, whose uh, introduction of various words into modern Hebrew quickly was caught on, and, uh, and everybody's using the same words. So in particular, furniture might be based on rehatim, maybe rehatim is based on rehatim that's mentioned in our weekly reading, and uh, it became, began to mean furniture over time. And if you like this video, please press like.